ladies and gentlemen, we have a special guest today on Ebro in the Morning, Laura Styles and Roseburg. Give it up for the legendary Sister Soldier. Thank you. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Where um, have you been? Uh, writing books. Writing yes. books. Yes. Hopefully writing bestsellers. Yes. And um, working on getting those books turned into films as well. Now, um, there was, and we'll, let's get right into it. You have a new book on the way out. Yes. What's the title? It's in stores today. Uh -huh. The title is A Moment of Silence, yes. Midnight Three. Midnight Three. And this is obviously Midnight Three. There was some, obviously, Midnight One and Midnight Two. Yes, I have uh, five novels so far, but they're all standalone right. novels, which basically means you can select anyone and it's a full story. It's not like you're out of the loop. So this is the third one about the character Midnight. Um, so can we go all the way back to Coldest Winter? Absolutely. That that's the that's the jump blueprint. Off point. Yeah, that's, that's the, the joint off. right there. <laughs> um, because I wouldn't. I'm not gonna sit here and act like I've read all your novels and okay. I've only skimmed through Coldest Winter. And even before this interview, I had to go back and review. All right. Right. Like I had to. Um, but I, you know, my interest in you as a personality always came about your outspokenness about black women, about hip hop, about our communities as black okay. people, et cetera, et cetera. Because you were very outspoken. Yes. Um. Not so much these days. I don't. I don't see you speaking the same way you used to. Well, uh, if you see me speaking, you'll see me speaking the same way. Got plus it, got it. the additional wisdom, hopefully. You know, over the years and over uh, as so days you're passed, still you're still speaking, going to schools and and oh, absolutely, okay, colleges and universities got it, got and it. even high schools got and it, got prisons, it. juvenile detention so centers. Very active. Yes, very active. It's just that uh, because back in the day, it was part of the national agenda. Mm -hmm. So you know, I was like on the cover of right. Newsweek and Roll in Rolling Stone and all these other different magazines. So it's very much on Front Street, and uh, it seemed like things just came around full circle recently uh, with all of this situation yes, with did. the police and innocent people being uh, murdered, executed by the police, right. you know, the kind of terror that the community feels right now, not just the hood, but, you know, even people just, you know, out college there in kids. their profession and college uh, kids and uh, professional athletes and their spouses, you know, getting wrestled down to the ground by the cops. So, yeah. How old were you when you first came, jumped onto the scene and you became this huge voice and people knew you first as an artist and then as a social political leader? How old were you? I was young. About that's to say, all, you were a kid, huh? That, that's all you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> I was young, and um, at that time, I was known as a youth leader. So uh, the interesting thing about the activism, see, people say all the time that I'm outspoken, but really, um, it's not so much about being outspoken. It's about doing the work. And at that time, I had summer camps and college preparatory programs, and I had a very solid relationship with the community, basically raising every everybody's children you know and putting these programs together that's how I got involved with uh, Diddy ultimately because he saw the work that I was doing in the community and then he put the power of bad boy behind the work right, right. that I was doing in the community and that you know had a about a seven-year run so uh, the work itself is is the evidence and the interesting thing about it was I was young and the young people that I was working with were young I wasn't even old enough to be their mother and neither were my college friends because we all became their teachers and their counselors and and volunteers but we weren't old enough to be their parents and then when the hip-hop community came and put the money and the power behind the organizing that we were doing there was another example of young hip-hop artists supporting young activists supporting young children from the hood Wow. In retrospect, we go back to that time. Um, is there any major headlines you could share with us? You know, because obviously you have young people on college campuses right now today. What mm. happened at the University of Missouri? Absolutely. Where they're using their power and influence on campus to make sure change happens and their voices are heard. Right. Yes. Um, are there any headlines that Sister Soldier could share with young people watching, listening right now? 
um, that may be some pitfalls, things to watch out for. Oh, absolutely. Um, yes. When we had the movement, uh, the thing about it was most of us originated in colleges. And so we studied the history. So since we studied the history of the civil rights movement, we were kind of very well prepared for our movement. So, for example, when we had a protest, we also had an organization of attorneys mm. that could come bail us out if mm. we got arrested for protesting or uh, we had a connection to uh, various organizations like an ACLU or or uh, kind of revolutionary uh, lawyers groups and, and we put together our defense fund I think the big difference uh, with us back then were we were connected all of the campuses across the country like I was a student at Rutgers University that's the college that I graduated from but I had activist friends at Columbia University at UCLA University at um, Howard University all across the country. So any issue that was an issue of justice that we want to take a stand for, we could get on the phone and students across the uni- uh, the country would take over a building at the university and say, we're not going to have business as usual until you deal with these issues of justice. And so that's how powerful the movement was at this time. So I would say to Black Lives Matters and to the, all of the young people that are coming up to just uh, do the groundwork, study when you can, uh, so that you can understand what to expect because the same thing always happens Which over is. and over in cycles. Well, you there's a, an injustice. Uh, there's a, a, a lack of people speaking out on the injustice. And then the people who speak out on the injustice injustice get attacked as though they're doing something wrong when they are actually uh, representing the love and the defense of the people. And so you have to have uh, a coalition of uh, professionals linked with students, students linked with the community leadership, community leadership linked with the ecumenical community. Uh, We had uh, preachers, rabbis, uh, imams that uh, gave Mm. us spaces to meet in churches, to meet in temples, synagogues, to meet in uh, that supported us because it was right. It was the right thing to do. So we weren't just out there, you know, on Front Street alone. We had some some backup. Even in New York, uh, we had the attorneys, C. Vernon Mason, Alton Maddox, uh, Colin Ferguson, uh, Michael Warren. We had all of these great... uh, Uh, people that work together. We would meet uptown at Sylvia's, (laughs) organize the movement, say what the problem was, uh, how many hundreds or thousands of students we were going to bring out. So it was a really, really big thing. So now when I see it, people say, oh, soldier, you're quiet. No, I'm not quiet. Uh, Do you want me to repeat myself? It's the same damn thing. You know, only the names of the victims have changed. But when I was young, we memorized the names of the victims because the things were so horrific that it stood out in our in our mind. Like even today, I can tell you was Eleanor Bumpers, Michael Stewart, Michael Griffith, you know, the whole Howard Beach thing, you know, and then uh, we advocated around even the Central Park uh uh, young Park men five, who yeah. got arrested and then ended up not being the ones who yeah, they got committed, a settlement. I saw who committed the crime. Yeah. yeah, but you know what? You can get a settlement, but uh, can you ever put a price on your freedom? That's right. You know what I mean? And what happens to you when you get locked up? You're traumatized. You're, oh, ca- yes. you're caged like an animal. You know, so even if somebody throws a million dollars at you, to be honest with you. You can't uh, get that time back. You no. can't get the or time when back. When those guys came in, you could you could sense in some more than others how scarred they were by the time they lost. Oh, absolutely. And I remember when they were young, you know, uh, how they were and then how they were after they came out and I could see the print of trauma on their faces so these were big things you know and uh in today's time when the Trayvon uh Martin uh murder happened you know these things just resonate in my soul uh, and it just brings up a memory because all of this has actually happened before. And it, you can and go before back. before that. And right, before that. There you go. Because you can go back to Emmett Till, but that's yeah. 1955. Right. And you, you know, I was we before weren't that. even born. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> you can get, and keep going all the way back. So, Emmett, you know. And when you really think about it, Emmett Till 
was a big deal because it was the first time that it became a big deal. It wasn't because it was the first time that it happened. Well, it became quite big the deal mainstream. That's what I mean because all of a sudden it got covered, and his picture from his his death photo was on the cover of right, newspaper. But here's the thing about that. The thing about that was we had black media at that time. Those stories would still not get covered if it wasn't for Jet, if it wasn't for Ebony. If that's it, wasn't it was for, Jet, right? Wasn't it Jet that I forget posted which the one, picture? I forget which one, but those were the reasons that then later a Newsweek comes into the yes. story and these things right. because of black media at mm -hmm. that time. Right. And we had communities where, you know, we still had the love. You know, it's a different era now. It's a very digital, very technical. Mm. And there's less face-to-face. -face, there's mm. less touching, less feel feelings, less contact. When I talk to my nieces and they're like 18 and 19, I have a niece that says, auntie, texting is touching. And I say, no, it's not the same it's thing. Not, not. You know, these uh, young people break up with each other by text. That's it. It's overdone. <laughs> you know, finish. <You're laughs> you know, these young people uh, meet each other by text or romance each other by text when a cat was young in my era he had to work on his rap he had, he had to, to work outside. on his game he had to yeah. wait outside when you come out the house <laughs> he had to get up his nerve to yeah. you know what is he going to do what is he going to say when he sees this woman it was a, a more a organic type relationships I think than today you know um I, I, the reason I wanted to go down that path is because I do know that in your work in mm. your in your books right some of the um the pain that you're talking about and Absolutely. that life experience of growing up in neighborhoods making young people making life decisions or making the wrong decision or um and I remember um the coldest winter was about winter, right? right. And, and her moving out wasn't she tried to her parents tried to move her out and she didn't want to leave the old life behind. Coldest, and it was, uh, winter, coldest winter ever. Yeah, yeah. Winter Santiago was the daughter of a Brooklyn hustler, a big time Brooklyn hustler, and. Uh, he came up so much uh, that he moved his family out of the hood, but they didn't want to go because they had been in the hood for so long. All their friends and family and peoples were in the hood. And so the story is about her trying to stay on top, mm. even as her father's empire uh, crumbles you know, get seized by the by by the police. So the coldest winner ever, that's the joint that But there's a piece of that story where it was like she didn't even have to choose that life. She just didn't want to let it go. Exactly. Well, and that's what happens. I mean, it's very difficult, as you know, to go from having to not having, no matter how you got it, whether you got it legally or you got it illegally. That's why when people get divorced, you know, if you was a big timer and you, you were giving your wife money and she was living mm -hmm. in a certain way, the judge would say, no, you got to keep her in the style she's accustomed to. <laughs> Right. The next thing you know, she's not your wife no more, but you're still paying still for paying. the plastic surgery. Yeah. <laughs> She so do you, when you when you went to um, bring it full circle to like to, to your literary career, mm. did you feel when you started writing books like that was more truly who you were? You know what I'm saying? Was was rap music for you and hip hop a, a, a way for you to express yourself? But when you found the pen in this sense and longer form expression, did it feel like this was more the way you were truly meant to express yourself? I was a writer in the first place. So, I've been a writer mm, since I was a young girl. Mm. I used to write letters to my mother because my mother used to say, oh, you got that strong voice, you better watch your tone of voice. You know, and so I didn't want to get the back slap. So, so I, you would write instead. I figured out that when something is wrong, if I take out a piece of paper and a pen, I can be like, dear mommy. And you can paint it Right. And it's not going to be no backslap, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, because yeah. it there's no tone of voice. And, you know, your mom loves a letter. Mom, yes. Moms love a letter. Exactly. Oh, man. And I, and I wrote several letters to my mother. And then after that, when I went to school, I got involved in a school newspaper, junior high school. We didn't even have a school new newspaper, so I created one. High school, we had a newspaper. And I also wrote in Ruc at Rutgers University in a newspaper. So I always was so where, a writer. So where did the rap part fit in? Was it just something that was fun for you that made sense at the time? Like At the time, I was so thick in the hood that <laughs> that public enemy, you know, Chuck D said, oh, you live in a life that I'm rhyming about and mm. they just thought it was dope you know to see uh, a young sister out there with all of the children and you know and they were like let's work together and that's how I got involved in hip-hop period it, it's it was just a merger between a community activist and a hip-hop activist band
Wow. Yeah, and that really, and, and that little spark, because the, the rap portion of your career was short-lived, but it really pushed everything. It, it brought made it all the name together. bigger. It, right. made it, it brought it all big. together. Well, actually, I even looked at it uh, like that back then, because uh, one time I took these children on a trip, and these these little children of homeless families, where they were just wild, full of life, full of energy, but they just did all kinds of crazy things. And I could never get them to do anything together. Well, one day we went on a, a trip, and I so I rented a school bus, and I put them all on the bus, and Rakim came on. And all of a sudden, it was the first time ever I saw them do anything together. They started rhyming Ra's rhymes. And the whole bus was rocking like this. Boom, boom, syncopation, nobody off beat. And if somebody messed up one word, the little eight-year-old girl would be like, no, that's not what he said. <laughs> and they start beefing about it. And, and it, I tell you, I had what they call an epiphany, a revelation right there. I was standing in the front of the bus. I said, that's it. Music. That's it. It's in the music. So hip hop to me was the vehicle to save the hood. It was the vehicle because it was a platform that was a global platform where we could talk about our local situations. But our local situation in New York was similar to the local situation yeah. in L.A. and in Chicago and, and Oakland, you know, everywhere. Oakland, Philly, uh, everything. Uh, Philly, everywhere. So that's why that I rode in that vehicle. But if the music was so successful in getting your message across, why why didn't you pursue like another album? Why didn't you continue? Oh, because when I came into music, uh, people got upset. You know, it was like, um, okay, Chuck D, Chuck D, uh, he said to me once, he said, Soldier, I don't know what it is. He says, I say it, and you know, it's music. It's all good. You say it, and man, it's an explosion. You're on the cover of Newsweek magazine. What's but I would on? feel like that would be more fuel for you to create more. It's a double standard for women. You know, it, black, they, black women especially. Black women they, 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 clamp, they clamp down on me heavy. You know, but what you luckily, what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how about the record company executives all calling me to a meeting and me sitting in a room and them saying, this isn't music what you're doing. Uh, yeah. uh, or saying to me things like, um, you know, we make music. We, we don't want any trouble from the president. <laughs> you know, it made it to the president. Oh, yeah. So, you and, know, and what, do, what do you, you got, say wait, to these executives? You got Sorry. at Clinton, right? You got at Clinton? No, this is pre Clinton. Well, he got at me. I didn't do anything yeah. to Clinton. You know, I was just doing my thing, you know, being an activist. And uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson invited me to a program, and I went and I spoke there, you know, and I spoke very passionately about. Uh, voter registration and 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 homelessness and all these different issues and you know Clinton came he was the speaker after me and then he was told, he president or he was running he was running okay. and then he told Jesse that he, you shouldn't have had sister soldier in here like which is like a classic slave master thing to do to tell somebody mm -hmm. who to bring to your house you know it was Jesse's place like how are you going to tell him that he shouldn't have me you know so whatever the case um it turned into a big thing and mainstream america got introduced to me in in a way through the music in a way that the hood knew me as an activist oh no that soldier that's the girl that takes our kids to camp you know oh yeah, yeah. you know she's the one who you know made sure we all had coats for the winter or whatever like that so it was a dichotomy kind of like uh the mainstream uh, world looking at me one way and then the the, the African-American Latino communities looking at me uh, in a very positive way right. and in, a, in a very positive light and saying, no, we know her. We know her, you know. And you were never, were you never signing up to be in a position, you, you signed up to be an actual activist who helped people directly on the ground. Exactly. You didn't plan on having a world where the mainstream media is coming at your neck. Absolutely not. When I left the uh, Washington, D.C., uh, after I did that convention with Reverend Jackson, when I left Washington, D.C., I went home. I was living in Brooklyn at the time, right across from Junior's Cheesecake. And um, uh, I got a call from my manager, and she said, Soldier, what did you do? And I said, what do you mean? And she mm -hmm. said, what did you do? I said, well, I just got in from D.C. I just sat down on the couch. <laughs> and she said, uh, turn on the TV. I said, for what? She said, Soldier, you're on every single channel. 
And I turned on the TV, and lo and behold, I was on NBC, CBS, ABC. I was on every channel, but I didn't know why. So I was really shocked. I was really shocked at, at the whole thing. And, uh, you know, it was just a big, uh, whew, it was a big, it was a mess, but it also had a very fateful feeling. Like, it was just something that was supposed to happen. It's just something that did happen. And I'm just grateful that when it did happen, that I was prepared to defend myself, to represent myself and my people and my community and my work. So... It's a pretty incredible story when you think about it. I mean, mm. can you really think, as I'm sitting here, of a, a, the role you played at the time you played it? And it's crazy. because what, what, what year were we talking about? 91? Yes. 1991. Exactly. And the role of a black woman publicly, strongly, and aggressively speaking out on things was, like, mind-blowing. People For hadn't everybody. heard this yet. But we had... We had and, and I wanted to go there because, you know, everybody's comfortable when the black woman is... Looking sexy, face down, taking, ass up, taking care of somebody's kids, um, cleaning the house. All of that was comfortable, right? Um, as soon as the black woman gets outspoken, everyone and 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 the Latino woman too, when she's dancing and being sexy mm -hmm. and eye popping, right. everybody's right. cool. When it gets real, because these are the women in our houses, right? That we're accustomed to the black woman being absolutely. Like, <laughs> yeah, right? holding it down. Right, <laughs> but then mainstream was like, "We've never, we're what? not. This isn't right." Like they were like, "What is this?" And it seemed. Did like... you feel you knew that in the moment though? In the moment this is happening, you knew that this was the typical. Oh, they go with the black woman being mm -hmm. sexy and you know wearing tight clothes. They're not good with the strong black woman holding down a communi community and being in a warrior front lines position. Did you Absolutely. know that in the moment? But you know, that was always my state of mind. I mean, I'm a historian. My degree is in history. I was, I was that young girl who would go to the Schomburg library in, in uh, Harlem, sit in the basement in the film room and watch Malcolm X and all of the uh, archive footage they had on the great leadership. I thought that Malcolm X was dynamic, like if I could mm -hmm. only have been alive in his era just to see it, and I could even see the light that surrounded him through the film, you know, I can see it on the he screen. Like it was oh man, I was so moved by that. I just thought that that. So I said to myself when I was young, I said, you know what? If you ever get on the mic, you better say a powerful word. Like you're not anybody's clown, and you're not a toy. You're not the pinup girl. You know, you if you get on the mic, you better at least match what you see that man doing. Um. So today, right, mm -hmm. and people are saying, you know, we haven't heard from you or you're quiet. And you're like, no, I'm not quiet. I'm right. still speaking. I'm still out there saying things right. um, and, and making sure that, you know, uh, women and the community are represented like you're still active. Absolutely. Um, are, do you feel like the legacy and the things that you've done are well represented by the youth today? Do you like what you're seeing? No, I don't like what I'm seeing, but... Um, what Can you articulate what you don't like? Well, the first thing, I, I don't feel the love, and the love really is the glue to hold any movement together. Uh, I think that now... Uh, there's just been a mood change in the community. You know, it's just not, uh, I think that the men the, uh, are not, not any longer in love with the women, mm. and the women aren't in love with the men. And the parents are sick of their children, and their children are sick of the parents. It's a very uh, mean mood in the atmosphere and in the air and that kind of makes us a group of individuals instead of a family instead of a group there's a, a lot of problems even if you look at reality television there's a lot of problems that uh, are off the political mainstream there are problems between the husband and the wife or the man and his girlfriend, or the man and his baby's mother, or the woman and her father, her son's father. You know, we have a lot of strife 
in the family right now. And that troubles me the most because without the love, you know, you got you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to progress. Mm. I, I often say when I speak at colleges and universities, you know, Martin Luther King was organizing men, women and children. We have an era right now where we identify ourselves as niggas, bitches and bastards. How do you organize niggas, bitches, and bastards? Mm. How do you do that? How do you organize sons that are angry because they never seen their father's face? How do you uh, organize sons that are angry because they was told one cat was their father, but it's not really him. It's somebody else. How do you organize women that are so hurt and they don't know how to heal and they don't even know how to self-critique themselves? So you got a situation now where women are also part of the problem, but don't know how to say, hey, you know, I actually am doing some things wrong in this situation and not just he's doing everything wrong in the situation. So right now, uh, the reason why I call my book A Moment of Silence is because I think that we need more than a moment of silence between us, separate from the political mainstream and elections and all of that kind of thing. I think we need a healing in our community, and I think we need a humbling in ourselves, like to pull back the arrogance and really look at what are we doing? What is the definition of a woman? What is the definition of a man? And what are we striving for with our families? It's easy to execute people who don't love each other. It's easy. You get away with murder. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens. Hmm. Sister Soldier, um, your book's on sale right now. I, yes. Listen, I think this conversation, I don't know if you're doing a, a lot of conversations um, yes. with people, but I hope that they're reaching out to you and, and you can continue to have this dialogue. Oh, I because so. the definition of a man and a woman, I think, is, is something that people are having a problem defining. Absolutely. Right. Um, I Absolutely. think what love actually is, people are having a problem defining. Right. right. So I think some of what you're talking about, not only is it just far gone, um, but even for blacks and Latinos that we have our family structures looking embarrassing on reality television. Right. Exactly. Um, and then on social media, it's out there. You know, I I deal with um, uh, Justice League New York and mm. um, NYC and some of the people in the Black Lives Matter movement, and uh, we give air time to that, and we have these conversations. And, you know, there's, there's things that... I don't watch reality television. Right. Like, I just... We just I just no, I turned it. it off after Basketball Wives. Yeah, I didn't I even said, get okay, that okay, we got a show here. All the, none of these women are wives, <laughs> but they're on a show called Basketball Wives. That's a problem. You know? And but, when you use the word wife, it shouldn't be synonymous with the name whore. It, it, there should be a difference between a wife and a whore, right. I think. No, I think you... I say all that to say, though, that while you, you, you articulated very well the problems, mm. you know, I guess maybe I'm naive to try to, like, find a silver lining, and I'm just happy that people are active mm. and want to have a voice and okay. want to fight for their rights and want to organize. Absolutely. Even though there may be flaws right. in there, right. the effort is still there and the desire is still there and the fight is still there because, you know, a lot of times, you, you know, we look at, I mean, I'm 40 now, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't have the same fight I had at 20. Absolutely. You know, um, but I'm glad there is a 20-year-old, 22-year-old who wants to fight. Absolutely. And be on the front and, and not afraid, right? Mm. So um, I just hope that we can continue to have this dialogue, and I hope you continue to go around and, and share because right. you did live it. And I'm sure there's a lot of stories in there that we weren't even able to get to. Phone calls you got after that moment with right. Reverend Jesse Jackson when you knew, or those meetings you speak about at record labels where you knew that they were putting the clamp on your voice. Right. And it was happening because you were a woman and you were black. Right. And 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 by design. I, I just want to uh, wrap up with a, a just tell you my Newsweek magazine story. I, I got a call said uh, back then during this time period. It said, uh, my manager said, Newsweek wants to do a profile on you. And I said, I'm not interested. I'm tired. Mm. And, you know, I had just been through some, I'm just tired. And she said, soldier, it's Newsweek. You have to do it. I said, no, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm just tired. I don't want to do it. I hung up the phone. She calls me back like 20 minutes later, and she said, soldier, if you do not do this interview, I resign. 
She said, I cannot be a competent manager, get you a Newsweek interview and have you just say you don't feel like doing it. Mm. And I didn't want her to resign because she was a good manager at that time, you know. So I went to the interview, but I'm telling you, I was like without sleep. I was exhausted. I sat there in the chair. I was like all lacking energy, everything, you know. And the photographer was trying to liven me up and so on and so forth. And... um asking me questions or whatever. And then he said, you know, stand on this chair, jump down from this chair and say we are at war. And I was doing everything like going through the motions, but I'm not feeling it. I get home. The next week uh, or so, the magazine comes out. I'm on the cover. No one ever told me I was going to be on the cover. So Uh, Some of the rap artists had a meeting, myself, Ice-T, Ice Cube, Chuck D, like a whole bunch of us had a meeting about some other things. And uh, all of them said, Newsweek told us, each of us individually and separately, that we were going to be on the cover, (laughs) which is why we agreed to to do the interview. And then so they were like, how did you end up on the cover? I said, I have no idea. So it kind of drove home the point to me that it was a part of my destiny and it was a part of just what was going on in the political world at that time. It wasn't, I wasn't the mastermind behind it. You know, there were just all of these high situations and high affluent political circles going on. And I was, you know, there. They wanted me to be their pawn, and it turned out that what they thought was a pawn was a queen. Mm -hmm. 